What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies. For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Well, we sing together then to God's praise and his glory. In number 156 in our blue hymn books here, God is in his temple, the Almighty Father. Round his footstool let us gather. Number 156. <clears throat> Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. O oh God, our Father in heaven, we come before you with gladness and with joy, rejoicing that indeed we can draw near, near through our Lord Jesus Christ into your nearer presence into the very place where you dwell, into your most holy temple. Indeed, it's, it's more than that, isn't it, as we've sung? It's you who has come to us, 
in Christ your Son, and come to make us into your holy temple, a living house where you have chosen to make your name dwell forever. Because in Jesus Christ, in, in he who is the Holy One, you have restored all things. You are, are bringing all things back to the perfection of your created beauty and order and wonder and life. And by your great mercy, you've called us to belong and to be your family, to be your people, to be your household, to be a people of your praise forever. Help us, Lord, we pray this morning to understand these things. Help us to grasp the wonder we may truly be a people of praise who tell forth your excellencies, who shout forth your praises to this whole world. How we need your Spirit, Lord, to strengthen us, to teach us, to guide us, to help us in our weakness. That we might be in our lives and upon our lips, a people of praise to the one who is above every name, the Lord Jesus himself. And so, Lord, acknowledging our needs, acknowledging our weakness, acknowledging our many and manifold sins, which we confess before you now in our hearts, seeking your forgiveness, and knowing the promise and the assurance of that forgiving grace. Draw near to us, Lord, we pray. We come in faith and trust as your children. We come seeking your face. We come needing your grace. We come trusting that we shall find mercy and grace for all our needs. So draw near to us, Lord, we pray. Come indeed and inhabit this, your holy temple. Presence yourself with us. And mold us and shape us, even in the fires of your blessed Spirit. We might come forth as gold, be shown to be forever people of praise that you have called us to be. So hear us, Lord, in this our morning prayer, for we draw near to you, our Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Well, let me uh, give you a very warm welcome. If you're visiting with us this morning, any of our own folk are away. All our young people are away this weekend at their youth weekend, so do be praying for them. But uh, that's why there are lots of parents here with uh, smiling, happy faces, having enjoyed a weekend of romance without their kids. But uh, we're delighted to welcome visitors always uh, to be with us in the fellowship here. And if it's your very first time, then let me extend a particular welcome to you. Hope we'll have a chance to meet you and greet you after the service. Uh, and uh, if you're in Glasgow for the day, if you're able to join us again this evening, we meet at 6.30. And uh, again, there's an opportunity there for us to share fellowship together on this, the Lord's Day. One or two notices, I think you have one of these on your seats, or it was put into your hand on the way in this morning. Uh, lots of notices there. One or two things to draw to your attention particularly, and a couple of things not on the notice sheet. Uh, first of all, in the middle panel there this coming week, you'll see that on Tuesday evening, it's the second week, just the second week uh, of our uh, latest Christianity Explored course, an opportunity to uh, engage with the primary materials, the Gospel of Mark, that uh, tells us all about the words and the works uh, of Jesus Christ. It's not too late to join. If you just think, well, I, I would have liked to have come to that, but I missed the first week, don't worry, it's not too late. Come along uh, this Tuesday evening, and uh, we would be delighted to see you, and you'll have an opportunity to engage with that material, to ask questions. Nobody will ask you to do anything you don't want to do. You won't have to speak. You won't have to pray. You won't have to do anything. You just sit and listen. But if you want to ask questions... 
around the tables with uh, Mark's Gospels opened if you want to probe, if you want to find out more about Jesus Christ, then it's a great opportunity to do that. So Tuesday night, it's not too late uh, to come along. Then uh, on Wednesday evening, uh, we have our congregational prayer meeting, and I warmly invite you to join with us here on Wednesday as we pray together as a fellowship for God's work throughout the world, and particularly for the many mission partners and ministry partners that we have a particular connection with. It's great when the whole church is able to give its voice in prayer, and uh, we'd love you to come and join us 7.30 till 9 uh, on Wednesday. And lots of other things there, but you'll see the top one under Nota Bene. Do put that date in your diary. We mentioned it previously, Wednesday the 6th of November, an important chance for us to meet as a congregation, uh, to think about mission, to think about our ministry, and to think about some particular things we need to give thought to uh, about our development for the future, and uh, very important that we can all be there if we possibly can. So please uh, don't let anything stop you. If you need a lift, if that's difficult for you, then let us know and we'll do our very, very best to make sure that everybody uh, is able to get here. Then finally, two things that uh, aren't on the sheet, and this is uh, for ladies, noting for your diaries. On uh, 16th of November, Saturday morning, there's a, a morning of a craft making, preparation for Christmas, and it's something for you to invite friends to, and there'll be a presentation of the gospel as part of that. So 16th of November, there'll be more details about that uh, in due course, but note that. And then the 23rd of November, there's going to be another uh, woman's breakfast. So 16th and 23rd of November, ladies, dates for your diaries. Well, we're going to uh, leave you to read the rest of these notices and uh, trust that you'll do that and use them, and uh, use them also to help you in your prayers as we pray together as a congregation. But we're going to turn now this morning to our Bible reading. We're back into the first letter of Peter, which uh, we've been studying. We've been away from it just for a few weeks. You'll uh, recall that this letter is to scattered Christians on the margins of the Roman Empire, and it begins with, with Peter focusing on what he calls authentic salvation. That is the Christian's true hope. We don't yet possess that uh, salvation. That glory awaits us at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the message of chapter 1, but Peter is very clear. It is a living hope that we have. We have a great assurance, he says in verse 3, through the resurrection of Jesus himself. Verse 7 of chapter 1, that guarantees our hope of glory and honor when he comes. And at the end of chapter 1, verse 21, he says that those who, who through Christ are believers in God have this living hope of glory. God raised him, and so we who have faith and hope in him have the promise that he will raise us to share that glory. But it's not all just about that future hope. We've seen that already. Peter says that we rejoice even now with joy that is uh, inexpressible and full of glory, because already we have found that we've become part of God's family. We are people who have true hope in God, and therefore we are people who have found our true home. We'll see that later in chapter 2, verse 25, where he says that once we were, we were far away like lost sheep, but now we have returned to the true shepherd of our souls, the Lord Jesus Christ. We've come to His fold. We've found our Heavenly Father, and we've found our true and eternal family. We're His children. Remember, we saw last time that from verse 13 onwards in chapter 1, it's all family language. He's speaking about children and a heavenly father and brothers and so on. And so from verse 22 of chapter 1 right through to verse 10 of chapter 2, that is Peter's particular focus. It's all about how authentic salvation cannot be separated ever from the authentic church. It's so important. Real salvation brings us into a new relationship with God, our Heavenly Father, and therefore, inevitably, it brings us into a new relationship with God's family, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Authentic salvation always creates authentic church. And that's what Peter is speaking about in these verses. We're looking this morning particularly at chapter 2, verses 4 to 10, but I'm going to read from verse 22 of chapter 1. 
just to remind us. So having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, says Peter, for a sincere brotherly love, well, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you've been born again, not of imperishable seed, but not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding Word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls. But the word of the Lord remains forever, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. So, putting away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, or perhaps better honored, chosen and honored, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and honored. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies, the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. And may God bless to us this, his word. Well, we've got a new song uh, to sing now for the first time. And uh, so it's uh, a version of Psalm 42, which is a hymn that uh, is a lament, really, in the Psalms about somebody who is far away from God's people and far away from God's temple. So if we could have the words up uh, on the screen, uh, I'll ask the musicians to play through. I was going to ask Edward to come and sing it, but unfortunately Edward's away preaching somewhere else. So, since my children are safely away on the youth weekend and won't die of embarrassment, I'll just give it a go myself and try and sing it to you. As long as none of you tell them that I did such an embarrassing thing (laughs) in the service. Otherwise, I'll I'll really get it at home when we come later on. But here's uh, a version of Psalm 42 and 43, and it's to a well-known old Irish folk tune, which some of you will perhaps know, and I hope that we'll find it quite easy to sing. And uh, if I make a real mess of it, then it'll be up to you to do it better once we we try it. As a deer pants for water, so I long for you, Lord. I hunger for your presence, I thirst for your word, for markers deride me, your God, he has gone, and tears they come streaming at night. That's more or less it, so uh, stand up and give it a go.
well done. I think that was pretty good for a first shot. So well done for trying that. Well, as the musicians play and as our offerings for the Lord's work are received, you might like to read again these words we'll be studying shortly, or maybe even read over Psalm 42 and 43 and uh, just meditate on these words as we've been singing them. But as we do that in the quiet, our offerings for the Lord's work will be received. Let's pray again together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you rejoicing again that we have access to the throne of grace, to the throne from which you rule this whole world, all that we see and know, and all the universe besides. We thank you that it is in our Father's hands that belong all the issues that trouble us, all the cares and the concerns of our hearts, all the great and mighty issues of moment concerning the nations of this world and their rulers, and their armies, and their forces, but also every one of the most intimate and personal issues that lie deep in the hearts of every one of us here this morning, the things which cause some of us this day to be grieving, hearts sore and torn because of the loss of a dear loved one and an aching void and a pain that seems almost inexpressible. 
others with fears and worries for their family, perhaps for a child or for a parent, for a loved one, concerns perhaps about uncertainty at work or in the future, stresses and strains looming darkly in the coming week. Some of us, Lord, coming quite differently, hearts full of lightness and song and joy and gladness, full of blessing because of the many goodnesses that you have bestowed upon our lives and everything in between. But you, our Heavenly Father, are the one into whose hands every one of these issues belongs and can be committed. And so we come, Lord, before you, together bringing our corporate prayers and praises for this world and for your people and for the kingdom of Christ. And as we do so also, bringing the silent, personal prayers and concerns of every one of our hearts. And thanking you, Lord, that as we gather together as your people, and you presence yourself in the midst of us, so you promise that we will find grace and mercy, whatever our needs. We want to pray this morning, Lord, as a fellowship, very especially for all our young people away for their Youth Weekend away at Lendrick Muir. We pray for all of them and for all of the leaders who give of their time and their energy so faithfully that along with parents, we might stand in solidarity as a fellowship to teach and to train our young people, nurturing them in the admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, this weekend that it would be an oasis of spiritual refreshment for them, Remembering, Lord, the many stresses and strains that our young ones face these days in their schools, not only the pressures of exams and academic achievement, but so much of the secular worldview that we live in now being forced upon them in so many different ways, challenging all that they are and all that they believe and all that they stand for as Christian young people some of them finding their PSE lessons so stressful and such a strain because very often they are the only one who thinks differently and to dare to say such a thing, to dare to say that their view is taken not from the television but from the Bible requires such great courage, such great strength. Lord, we pray that every one of our young people both those who are away and those younger ones still here with us, that they would be protected in their tender lives. We pray that we as a church would love and cherish them and encourage them in every way that we can to stand firm as soldiers of the cross. We pray that they would come back from this weekend, having been strengthened by your word, having been encouraged by the fellowship with others who stand where they stand, we pray that as they look at those who lead them, that they would see in them examples that they long to emulate of those, some of them just a little older than them, but standing true to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, bless our young ones, we pray, not only guarding and keeping them for an eternal future as your children, but strengthening them and fitting them and equipping them for an earthly future as servants and soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ all the days of their lives, that from even some of them might come great gospel workers through whom your kingdom is enlarged and expanded to the glory of your Son. Likewise, Heavenly Father, we pray for the many students in our city here in Glasgow, not least those associated with our own congregation. We pray for the many opportunities that they have in the university campuses with friends and with classmates to witness to the Lord Jesus. But there too, the struggle is great, the temptations are strong. How easy it is to slip away. How easy it is to forget the constant need that we have 
to meet together, to exhort one another, to meet together in the presence of the Lord, who is alone our strengthener and our shield. We pray, Lord, for all of those involved in the student work in our own congregation here that release the Word on Thursday nights and other meetings, small and large. We pray that all of these things would be used to strengthen your people for their life of witness in the university and beyond. We thank you, Lord, for the work of UCCF and for all of the staff workers who help run and train and encourage those in Christian unions throughout the land. Pray especially for Kaz Dodds and for Andy Baxter, our own members as they're part of that team, and all the others that they work with and the relay workers. We ask, Lord, that through them also your work would increase and be multiplied, that many students, many who are at this threshold of their future, at such a critical age and stage, that they would be turned and rescued from darkness into light, receiving the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ and going on to be those who call others from darkness to light and who tell forth the excellencies of Him, our Savior, who is our great Redeemer. So, Father, we pray for all of us here this morning as a church for this assembly of your people. How we praise you, Lord, that we assemble here not alone, but in the full knowledge of your presence with us, moving in this place by your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. So we ask once again that as we turn now to your word, you would open our eyes and the eyes of our hearts and open your word to our hearts. That we might feed upon the living word and might be strengthened and equipped and given joy in our hearts that together we might be truly a people of praise, of living worship and of living witness to our Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, as we come to God's Word, then we're going to sing once again number 566. 566. Be still, for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here. Number 566.
Well, do turn with me, if you would, to uh, the passage we read there in 1 Peter, chapter 2, and we're looking at verses 4 to 9, to, to, to 10. When a Christian finds their true hope in Christ, then immediately they find their true home in Christ. They find their true belonging, and that belonging is in and to the church of Jesus Christ, the authentic church. But what is the authentic church? Well, for Peter and for the rest of the New Testament, the answer lies not in matters of organization or institution, nor in structures or buildings or order or liturgy, far less anything to do with that denominations or national bodies or anything like that, you'll find absolutely nothing about that in this letter, indeed not in the whole New Testament. But what Peter is concerned with when he is explaining what the authentic church is, is explaining it in terms of the authentic house of God. A house, though, that is not a physical superstructure, not that kind of building, but rather it is a living house or household. It's the household of God, where God Himself in Christ is head of the household and where He Himself dwells with His family and will do so forever. Now, this language of household isn't unique uh, to Peter, of course. It's very common in the New Testament. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, that's the verse that gives us the words that are on the front of our bulletin every week. So very clear, isn't it? The household of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and the buttress of the truth. That is not pillars of stone, but a living building, a building that preserves and portrays and proclaims the truth of the salvation that is in Jesus. And uh, here in our passage, Paul, uh, Peter is giving us three pictures, three different pictures of what that household really is. In chapter 1, verse 22, down to chapter 2, verse 3, as we saw last time, he pictures it as a family of love. The church is the true family of God. It is his permanent progeny, born together and being brought up together through the living and abiding Word of God in Christ, and therefore sharing in his love together. We're born again, verse 22, for a sincere brotherly love, and therefore we must love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And the sign that uh, babes in Christ are growing up in the church is that brothers in Christ are growing together in love by putting away, chapter 2, verse 1, malice and deceit and envy and so on, and instead drinking in the spiritual life of God Himself as we feed on His truth, which alone can keep us for salvation. The authentic church is a family of love. And therefore, obviously, if that is not what is in existence, then it's not the true church of Christ at all, no matter what badges or structures or buildings, or even what perfect creeds and confessions or purity or learning there might be. Without love, all of these things are nothing. Just read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 again, if you don't believe me. But the church is more than just a family of love. The house of God is also, according to Peter, his temple. It's a temple of life. Chapter 2, verse 5, we are living stones being built into a spiritual house. And it is also God's household. It is a people, a people of light. Verse 9, a people for his own possession who proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So I want us to focus this morning on these two further pictures of the authentic church as a house of life and of light. So look first then at verses 4 to 8, where uh, Peter tells us that the authentic church is a temple of living worship. A temple of living worship. The true temple of God is, says Peter, his permanent priesthood built together for living and enduring worship of God in Christ. 
and therefore sharing his life with him. That focus in these verses is all upon the temple. That's what the house of God always referred to in the Old Testament, the place of priesthood, of sacrifice. Notice, always, always in the presence of God himself, where God's Shekinah glory filled the tabernacle when it was completed. Read about that at the end of Exodus. And then later on, when the temple was built in Jerusalem, the, the, the glory of God likewise came and dwelt in the temple. God was present there. And all the language here is also temple language about priests and sacrifices and so on. And all of these things that are associated uniquely with the house of God, the temple of the living God in the Old Testament, are now applied, you can see, unequivocally to the church of Jesus Christ. And the point is that the, that the church of Jesus Christ is not just a family of love for one another. It's not just the house of all God's people. It is the place where God himself actually dwells. The temple is where God, the only true and living God of heaven and earth, the place where he can actually be found. It's the only place on earth where the divine life of God could be found and encountered. So understanding what and where that temple is is foundational, isn't it, to understanding the sole place where, where man can encounter God, where man can find the purpose of his life with God. And the first thing to note about these verses is that they speak of the sole place, the sole place of man's encounter with the God of heaven. Now, just think back to the very beginning for a minute. Man was created to be a worshiper. The first question of the of the shorter catechism. Some of you will know it is this. What is the chief end of man? And the answer it gives is the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That is, the purpose of man is to worship God with all that he is. So John Piper is right when he writes in his book about mission that mission is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Mission exists because worship doesn't. The world was once, of course, filled with true worship. We see it in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. The Garden of Eden was the place where God dwelt with man. Perfect harmony, a world of, of perfect worship. Eden was God's temple on earth. And man was welcome there. Man was glorifying God in everything he did as God's image bearer. He was in enjoying God and his kingdom to the full. But of course, man's rebellion ruined that whole world of worship. Man was cast out of God's temple. But of course, God, in his mercy, didn't abandon humanity. He came again, still to make his home among his chosen people. He literally pitched his tent, his tabernacle, right in the midst of the camp of all God's people, Israel. And that tabernacle was like a miniature Eden. God made his dwelling among his people. In the, in the words of Deuteronomy, he made his name dwell there in the tabernacle. And then later, when the people were settled in Jerusalem, Solomon built a permanent temple. And again, 1 Kings chapter 8 tells us that that was the place where God has made his name to dwell, right in the midst of his holy nation. That's why years later, the exile of the Israelites was so terrible. The people were sent away from the place where God dwelled. They feared being cut off from God himself, not just being cut off from their homes and their, and their country, but from God. And that's the lament in Psalm 42. It's, a, it's about a, a, an Israelite who's away, way up in the north and far away from the temple and feels far, far away from the place where God dwells. That's why his heart's sad. And yet, as, as Ezekiel's vision makes clear, when he saw the glory of the Lord rise up and, and leave the temple and move east, even as uh, Israel were to be taken off into captivity in Babylon. 
It just reminds us that God is never bound by mere structures. He dwelled in the midst of his people even in their exile in the wilderness and later. However distant that might have felt to them. And of course, Ezekiel saw also, didn't he, looking to the future. He saw the glory of God returning at last to the temple, indeed to a new temple, a glorious everlasting temple, a temple whose life would, would flow out to the whole world and declare to the world forever, the Lord is there. It's the last words of the prophecy of Ezekiel. The Lord is there forever in his new temple. Do you see, the point that is clear all the way through the Bible is this. The only true worship of God, the only way to encounter the true and the living God is in his true house, in his temple. The only way that human beings can meet the God of heaven. It's just worth turning up one reference so we get this really clear. Turn with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 12. I think it's page 156 in our church Bibles. I just want to get it really clear. Deuteronomy 12 and verse 5. Moses says, You shall not worship the Lord your God the way the pagan world does, with temples all over the place. No, you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose to put his name, to put his habitation there. And that refrain is repeated again and again all the way through that chapter. Why? Why is that so important? Well, simply because their God is real. He's not like the imaginary gods made up out of man's religion. You can manufacture them any old place and put them in any old temple and go and worship any old place because they're not real. But God is the living God, the real God. And so he can only be found where he really is, where he chooses to make himself known. And so where now, for us today, is the one unique place that the living God has chosen to make himself known on earth forever? Where is that one true temple, the sole place where acceptable sacrifice to God can be made. Where is that? That's the key question. But the answer, says Peter here in verse 5 of our chapter, is very plain. In Jesus Christ alone. The spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God must be offered, says Peter, through Jesus Christ. He is the fulfillment of all God's promises to dwell among his people at last permanently. He is the fulfillment of all the prophecies about that new and everlasting temple that was foretold. He is the foundation stone that Isaiah spoke of, quoted here in verse 6, do you see? The foundation stone of the new temple in Zion, which is built upon the Messiah himself, the chosen and precious one, the honored one. Now, Peter's not making this up. Let's be clear about that. He had heard Jesus himself say exactly these things many times. Something greater than the temple is here, said Jesus in Matthew chapter 12 to the Pharisees. Well, what on earth could possibly be greater than the house of God on earth? Except the coming of the everlasting dwelling place of God incarnate, in person, dwelling in the person of his Son. John chapter 2, Jesus says, you destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. And John says he was speaking about the temple of his body. And of course it was Peter himself, wasn't it, to whom Jesus spoke those famous words about building his church upon this rock. It's quite extraordinary really, isn't it, that the church of Rome has this incredible idea that Peter somehow was the the foundation stone of the church, and became the first pope and all the, the successes of Peter are the foundation stone, and you can only have access to God in Christ through communion with Rome and its pope. 
You really have to wonder what they can make of Peter's own words here. It could hardly be plainer that Peter himself was very clear that the rock, the cornerstone, the living foundation of the church was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. Peter points us to no other rock but Christ, the living stone. Who gives us access to God? Who truly holds the keys to eternal life? Who can make us part of that living temple that is his true body? Answer, clear as day here from the Apostle Peter, right just in front of us. It's not Peter. It's Jesus. And he alone, verse 4, as you come to him. Verse 6, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And notice verse 4, he is the one chosen, honored by God, and yet rejected by men. And so Peter is telling us that although you also may be rejected by men, the same honor, verse 7, do you see, is for you who believe in him. What a huge comfort and assurance that must have been, don't you think? to Peter's first readers facing persecution, rejection by the world, and, and don't forget, rejection by the religious establishment of the day. If many of them were Jewish believers, and I think many of them must have been, it must have felt so hard, don't you think, to seem to be no longer part of that, that great heritage of the Jewish faith. They were outside no longer had access to temple or priest or sacrifice, none of these grand buildings to see that gave them that, that great sense of the historic faith. To the religious establishment, these believers Peter has writing to had gone outside into the darkness. I guess probably that's how some people will consider our church today. But no, says Peter, in fact, it's the opposite. You have come in, as they have come to him, to Jesus. It's they who have found everlasting fellowship with God in Christ. It's just as Hebrews 13 says the same. We go to him outside the camp. But that is the place of true and real fellowship with the living God. That is the place of acceptable sacrifice to God, because these sacrifices are made in the name of Jesus, the only Savior. What an encouragement that ought to be to Christians today. Although we might be despised, rejected, but it is among the unimpressive looking, perhaps rather hard pressed people of true faith in Jesus, not not in the grand cathedrals and the magnificent abbeys and religious places, that God is truly to be found. Because unless there are living stones within those great ancient stones, then there is no temple of real and living worship. Only, says Peter, among those who come to him, who believe in him. But the living Lord Jesus Christ is the sole place where the God of heaven can be found. And you see also what the sole purpose of this new life in God is when it is found. It's a life of restored worship, verse 5. As we come to him, we are, says Peter, a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God in Jesus Christ. We are redeemed, in other words, for a life of worship and for lives of ongoing spiritual sacrifice, just as Paul says in Romans 12, verse 1. Our whole bodily lives as believers is to be living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Living sacrifices come from living stones. Now, again, all the, the Old Testament Temple language is applied to the church, and yet it's transformed to be clear that this is something every single Christian partakes in. 
It's important to remember, by the way, that not all the sacrifices by any means of the Old Testament were just about sin and guilt. There were sin and guilt offerings, but there were fellowship offerings and peace offerings and first fruits offerings and all sorts of things which, which expressed communion of God's people with him, fellowship. And that's what, what Peter is meaning when he still speaks about us offering sacrifices, not sacrifices for sin. Of course not. There's no more of those at all because Christ alone has made that great atoning sacrifice. Peter is absolutely clear about that. Three key times throughout the letter, he makes it explicit. Chapter 1, verse 18, he is the sacrifice for sin. He ransoms us by his blood. Chapter 2, verse 24, he is the sin bearer who bears our sins in his body on the tree. And then chapter 3, verse 18, he is the substitute, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. He is the one great sacrifice for sin, finished forever. But, he says, we do offer spiritual sacrifices from hearts of love that honor God by loving and honoring the Lord Jesus Christ, his Son. And the book of Hebrews, which speaks so much about sacrifices and so on, tells us exactly the same thing if you read it later on. Chapter 10, we're told that Christ's sacrifice for sin is once and for all. We're sprinkled, he says. We're washed. Exactly the language Peter uses in this letter. There remains no ongoing sacrifice for sin. Finished. But when you come to Hebrews chapter 12, we're commanded still to offer acceptable worship with reverence and awe to God. Chapter 13 speaks of, of true sacrifice, of praise coming from both lips and lives that bless the Lord in Jesus' name. See, the Bible is very, very clear. Don't let's get this wrong. Salvation is not just from our sins. But salvation is for the restoration of our whole true humanity. And that means that we are redeemed for true worship of God forever. Peter says that back in chapter 1, verse 18. He says that we're, we're redeemed from futility for a great purpose. To be again those who share God's home. To be a temple be a priesthood of those who live to glorify God in lives of true worship. Lives that offer themselves in their entirety to the Lord Jesus Christ in lives of living sacrifice. That's how the whole New Testament speaks of these things. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says, we, we offer fragrant sacrifices to God as we image him, as we walk in love. That's real worship. Or Philippians chapter 4, when Paul's speaking about the money gifts that the church there have sent to fund his mission, he says it's a fragrant offering and a sacrifice acceptable to God. That's true temple worship. On Hebrews 13, as I've said, it speaks of sacrifices of praise to God that please him, as lips and lives please him. And the chapter's all full of things that that worship entails. It means showing hospitality to strangers, visiting Christian believers in prison, honoring marriage, whether you're married or not, living contentedly and not greedily, honoring Christian leaders, and so on and so on. That's real temple worship, living worship. And you see, where all that is happening, where all of that is joyfully in evidence, you're seeing evidence of darkness defeated and Eden restored in the temple of living worship, which is truly indwelled by the Spirit of the living Lord Jesus Christ. Real living stones are being built into a real spiritual house where God himself dwells. But, and we must recognize this, we must take this to heart, who can be part of that dwelling of God with men? Peter's answer is very clear, isn't it? Verse 7. Only those who come to Jesus and therefore offer sacrifices through Jesus Christ can be part of that temple. 
Verse 7, the honor is for you who believe. The Bible is quite clear. No manner of offerings to God can be acceptable to him without faith in Jesus Christ. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, says Hebrews 11. Now, you cannot come close to God the Father if you reject Jesus Christ the Son. Look at the second half of verse 7. For those who do not believe, well, just as the Scriptures foresaw, he, the cornerstone of the church, becomes, verse 8, the stumbling stone, a rock of offense. And how often it's so, that is absolutely true, isn't it? People speak of God, they want God, they're searching for God. But often when they are confronted with this uncomfortable fact, this unanswerable fact in Scripture, that the one and only exclusive path to God lies in surrender and obedience to Jesus Christ, well, then people are offended. Often they're enraged. They won't have that exclusive nonsense. But see how clear Peter is. He tells us this unbelief is not accidental, verse 8. It's willful disobedience. It's denial. They stumble because they disobey. You see, he can't say, well, I wish I had your faith. I wish I had, but I just can't believe. No, says Peter, you can obey. The problem is you will not obey. There are only two responses to Jesus Christ. There is the response of obedient belief, or there is the response of disobedient unbelief. Only those two. And it's always been so. Jesus himself in Matthew 21 quotes these very words of Isaiah in the parable of the talents about Israelites who reject God, who constantly rejected his prophets, and so they reject his son. Stephen in Acts chapter 7, summing up the whole history of Israel, says, always, like your fathers, you reject the Holy Spirit. Paul in Romans chapter 9 quotes it as well, about the mystery of so many of his Israelite kinsmen who stumble over the exclusive call of Christ the Messiah. But Peter says this is how God has destined it to be, verse 8. It's no surprise to God. And it shouldn't be a surprise to us. This is the sovereign purpose of God to determine the destiny of all people on this planet. One writer puts it like this, God's act of appointing Jesus as the living stone has become both honor for believers and dishonor for unbelievers. This was God's design. Everything happens according to his will. The church of Jesus Christ is a temple. Indeed, it is the temple of living worship. It's the place alone where true worship of God is possible through Jesus alone, where the purpose of our lives can be realized and fulfilled. The only place. Well, it needs saying then, doesn't it, that uh, such a thing as interfaith worship is not just wrong, it's just quite impossible. No more possible for the Christian church to have interfaith worship today than our Elijah could have had interfaith worship with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. It's just impossible. Because outside the church of Jesus Christ, there is no worship. There's no salvation. There's no fellowship at all with the one true and living God of heaven. But inside that is for all who come to him, says Peter. Whatever you are, whatever you've done, inside is that wonderful declaration of verse 5, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For everyone who comes to him. So friends, don't let's feel second class if you're not part of some grand religious institution. You belong, and indeed you are, 
the temple of living worship where God himself dwells, sharing his life with all his people. And none can ever steal away from you that living building. Not ever. Not ever. No, sadly, rather, it's those who reject the true temple, Christ, in order to keep their dead temples. You'll see the rock fall on them and crush them, as Jesus said. The true church is a living one. It is a temple of living worship. And, says Peter, much more briefly in verses 9 and 10, the church is a people of living witness. The people of God, he says, are his permanent proclaimers, bound together for living and enduring witness to God in Christ, and therefore sharing his light in the world. Peter's point is that the temple of living worship is the people with a living witness to Christ. And where there is that, there is authentic church. And where there is not, there isn't. Simple as that. It's not about size, but it is all about substance. Jesus said, where even two or three are gathered together in my name. Notice that? And there he is in the midst. He still causes his name to dwell there. It's his temple. And there is the church, the ecclesia, which is where we get our word ecclesiastical from, the ecclesia, the congregation of God's people gathering. That is what that word actually means all the way through the New Testament. How much better... It would have been for us in our Bibles if Martin Luther had had his way, and instead of translating it church, it had been translated congregation or assembly all the way through the Bibles. How much better we would have been, how much confusion we would have saved ourselves. But there is where the Lord is. You are God's temple, and God's Spirit dwells in you, he says, uh, Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 3. That's why he says, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. That is a very stark warning to anybody who would seek to divide and destroy a real church, a real congregation of God's people. But you see here that Peter's focus is once again on the privileges and on the purpose of being God's church. The privileges that he says we're God's own people, verse 9. We're precious in his sight. Again, just as all the language of God's house, the temple, is applied to the church, so again, all the, the language that God in the Old Testament applies to Israel is now applied to his household, the church. That is not to say that the church now replaces Israel. That is not what the New Testament teaches. But rather that the church is the fulfillment and the consummation of Israel's destiny as God's people. And now God's Israel is gathered from all nations. It's not just Jews, but Gentiles also, who are all one in Christ Jesus. And so you, he says, who belong to the church, verse 9, you are a chosen race. It's from Isaiah 43, where in the midst of those marvelous servant songs about the Messiah, God promises that through the Messiah, one day, his redeemed people would be renewed in their true calling to be his glorious witnesses to the world, to declare the praises, the excellencies of God to the world. That's where it's quoted from. It's the same word quoted by Jesus in Acts chapter 1, when he promises the coming of the Holy Spirit upon his whole church for witness. That is the privilege of the church. You're a chosen race for witness. And you're a royal priesthood, he says, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, words that echo God's words to Israel at Mount Sinai, where the whole nation of Israel are called to be priests of God, set apart for obedience to God, and to be lights to the whole world all round about, because they are his treasured possession, is the words used there. Precious and beloved in his sight. That is the privilege of the church of Jesus Christ. And don't miss verse 10. It's a quote from Hosea chapter 2, which reminds us that none of this is remotely because the church is somehow superior or because Christian people are somehow better or superior to others. 
all of this, he says, do you see all of this is a result of God's sheer mercy. We're not God's people because of our actions. Our actions excluded us. Once you were not a people at all, he says. But now, because and only because we have received mercy, we are his people. Hosea originally was speaking, of course, about Israelites who had been cast off by God because of their sin and become just like the pagans, just like Gentiles. But now, says Peter, his mercy makes all sinners, Jews and Gentiles alike, into his precious people, set apart by God's Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So every Christian believer, everyone who has come to Jesus in obedient faith, shares in this inestimable privilege of being his people, a true Israel, bound to him with an everlasting covenant, cleansed by his blood, set apart for his rule. We are above all things his people, his nation forever. And of course, that will beg the question, won't it, as to whom we therefore owe our first allegiance when there is a clash, inevitably, between earthly nation and our heavenly nation. It was Margaret Thatcher who once said, you can never be over-patriotic, and that's true, but for Christians, our ultimate patriotism is not to an earthly nation, but a heavenly one. In fact, the hymn that Baroness Thatcher chose to be sung at her funeral, I vow to thee my country, all other, uh, all earthly things above, it, that hymn makes that point very forcibly when it says, there is another country most dear to those who love her, a heavenly country. And if it's that country as God's holy nation that is most dear to us, then there will be, won't there, clashes there will be conflicts in this life because this world will not tolerate rival patriotism. It's all right as long as we keep our temple worship private. That's fine. But as soon as it begins to intrude upon the public sphere, that is another matter. No, no, no. We don't want that kind of Christianity intruding its views. We don't want you forcing yourself upon our society. That was the hostility that Peter's readers were facing in the first century. That's the hostility, friends, that any witnessing people, any missionary church will inevitably face in the 21st century. But Peter says this temple cannot be kept private. This people cannot remain silent because Peter is clear the privilege of God's people implies the purpose that we are God's proclaimers. We are chosen, he says, to be a priesthood, and our great task as the priesthood is to proclaim the excellencies of our great Redeemer and Lord, the one who has called us into light. A big part, Peter is saying, of our spiritual sacrifices as God's temple is the telling forth of the wonders of our great Redeemer. Now, the language here includes, obviously, all the sharing forth of the truth of the gospel. But again, the focus is particularly on the corporate. It is the public telling forth of the wonders of God by all his people, especially when they are gathered together as his church, as the assembly, the household of God. It's the language of corporate acclamation that's used often in the Psalms. It's exactly the language of Isaiah 43, where God promises in these latter days of fulfillment that his people will be his witnesses, that they might declare my excellencies, my praises. Just as on the day of Pentecost, all of those who were around the church on that first day heard in their own language the praises of God being proclaimed. That's what God's temple does. His temple, his dwelling, his presence and his power is there when his people gather to tell forth his wonders. In words of preaching, in words of, of prayer, in words of corporate praise. 
The church is a people of living witness. That's what it means to be a royal priesthood. Paul in Romans 15 talks about his priestly service of telling others about the wonder of God so that outsiders, so that Gentiles will be drawn in themselves to become living offerings to God through Jesus Christ. And the whole church, he's telling us, is part of that. 1 Corinthians 14, Paul tells the Corinthians to ensure that whatever their gatherings are like, it is clear that the telling forth of God's wonders in words that people can understand is at the heart of them. So that, he says, if any outsider, even somebody who has no knowledge at all of these things, who is totally ignorant, if he comes in, he'll be struck. And he'll say, surely God is among you, and he will bow down in worship and serve the living God. He'll be converted and give his life to Christ because he senses that God is in the midst. He's really there. I don't know if we really believe that. Psalm 22 verse 3 says that God inhabits or, or is enthroned on the praises of his people. And where his church is real, where it is a temple of living worship, and where his people are gathered as a people of living witness, telling forth in their lives and on their lips the excellencies of our great Redeemer, then he is there. There I am in the midst, says Jesus. And he can be met, and he can be heard, and he can be found. Is a wonderful Savior. God is in His temple. He really is. But we want people to find God. And of course, the best thing that we can possibly do is bring to people to God's temple to meet Him. Bring Gentiles, bring outsiders to the place where God inhabits the praises of His people, to the church. That's why quite simply the best form of evangelism is and, and has been since the day of Pentecost to bring people into the orbit of the church of Jesus Christ, bring people to experience the living church at any of its gatherings or activities, above all, especially at its chief gatherings on the Lord's Day when we're gathered together as one, because they're coming into the house of the living God when they do that. So, as Peter says, even if they know nothing before God can and God does and God will meet people there in his temple, among his people, and he will call them to himself. Most people I know who are truly converted get converted because somebody just bring them, brings them to ordinary church. But God loves to be in the midst of ordinary church. <coughs> because it is the authentic church. A family of love, brothers and sisters, children sharing his love, a temple of life, priests who truly dwell with him sharing his life, and a people of light telling forth his praise and sharing his light to all. It's a picture, isn't it, of humanity redeemed and restored and rejoicing in their true identity. So let me ask you as I close, are you part are you part of that wonderful reality, that future that is the only future for time and eternity? Have you come to him, to Jesus Christ the Lord? Have you stopped disobeying his word and believed in him so that you won't be put to shame? It might be that you hesitate and you wonder, well, how do I know? How do I know he'll receive me? How could I know that? You don't know me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I'm like. How could I know that I'm one of the elect of God's foreknowledge, one who is redeemed by the blood of his Son? How can I know if I could really be one of God's chosen people? Just look at verse 4 again. Peter's answer is clear. Come to him. Verse 7, believe in him, and there will be honor for you. Because, as verse 10 says, it's all about his mercy, his mercy, not about your merits. Peter, friends, 
can say that on the highest authority. <coughs> Come to me, he heard the Lord Jesus say, and I will give you rest. And whoever comes to me, he said, I will never, under any circumstances, cast out. Friends, don't let anything, don't let anyone keep you outside your true home, outside your true household, in God's house of life and light. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your home whose doors are wide open to this earth through the work of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. May every one of us hear him and come to him and believe in him and rejoice in him. And then may we likewise go out and call others to join the light of the one who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous family of light and life. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to end by singing a hymn that enables us to tell forth God's praise. Number 628, Tell Out My Soul, The Greatness of the Lord. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.